unique and most, you know, stories you haven't heard. Um, I can cite just about every single one of them, but I think I'm going to ask I'm going to ask you for some feedback. Um, you're kind of my test audience for this this different approach, and, and the reason for that is, you know, I, I'm usually speaking about this to groups outside of the out of the great, Greater Seattle area, you know, folks who really don't have a clue on this whole thing called the 100th, the 442, and the MIS. I mean, if you go to Hawaii. If you start going into this chronology, all the awards and decorations, people are just going to throw, you know, go to sleep or throw things at you. So, you know, most of you know about this history, you know, one form or fashion, television shows, news shows, interviews, periodicals, friends, neighbors. You probably know most of this. I'm not going to bore you with that, but some of that is up here. Um, so again, pay attention. Uh, if, if I say something new, just kind of tuck it away because I'm going to ask you for some feedback a little bit later. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, okay. Family's nodding. That's good. That's good. Next slide, please. Real quick, this is what we're going to talk about. But first, um, we're going to look at something that I'm part of the National Veterans Network in, in, in the mid 2000s, 2005, 2006, a group of Japanese American organizations and veterans organizations got together and say, hey, how can we piggyback on Representative Adam Schiff's bill to award the Congressional Gold Medal? And at first it was just to the 442. And, and then later we included the 100th. And after a flurry of activity, we were able to get the MIS added. And Senator Boxer was key for that because it had already passed the House and got sent over to the Senate. So she was absolutely key to get the MIS added to that to that public law. Was it 111, 252? I think that's what it was. Um, but we're going to look at a video produced by David Ono, who has done um, a number of well-produced, well-laid-out, very articulate man who uh, was just recognized by the government of Japan with the Order of the Rising Sun with Padawin Flowers? I think that's what it was. It's a very high award for his work with the Japanese American experience during World War II. Uh, so we're gonna look at that clip. It's on the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. This is the Congressional Gold Medal, awarded to one of the greatest fighting units in military history. Brave warriors who unflinchingly dove into battle during World War II, no matter the odds, men who bled and died for their country. But that's only part of their story. They're known as the 100th Infantry Battalion, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, and the Military Intelligence Service. As was policy at the time, they were segregated units of Japanese Americans called Nisei, born in the United States and Hawaii from immigrant parents. What's remarkable, they fought while many of their families were unjustly locked up in American concentration camps, dying on the battlefield for the very country that did that. These brave men called it loyalty. They believed fighting and dying for the United States of America would allow their families to live a more normal life, a life of acceptance. Like the 100's Sadao Munamori, who courageously fought through some of the toughest battles in the war. On April 5th, 1945, a live grenade bounced off his helmet and toward two of his comrades. Diving on top of it, Munamori smothered the blast, saving his men at the cost of his own life. Months later, the picture of his mom he always kept with him was returned to her, now stained with his blood. He would become the first Nisei in history to be awarded the Medal of Honor. 442nd's Daniel Inouye from Hawaii found himself face to face with three German machine gun nests Shot in the stomach, the leg, and losing his arm, he fought on, silencing all three nests, earning him the Medal of Honor. This great warrior survived to become one of the most beloved senators in American history. Khan Tagami's dangerous covert world of the military intelligence service had him sneaking through the jungle with a handful of brave men, with an earshot of the enemy, using what he heard to help guide his men out of danger. After the war, he would become General MacArthur's right-hand man and the only member of the occupational forces to have a private audience with the Emperor of Japan. Thousands of individual stories of bravery and sacrifice, accompanied by great humility. Men who fought fiercely through Italy, France, Germany, the Pacific, 
and then dealt with hate at home. By the end of the war, the 100-442nd was the most decorated unit in American military history for its size and length of service, and the MIS is credited with shortening the war by two years due to their remarkable ability to stay a step ahead of the enemy. As President Harry S. Truman welcomed the Nisei home, he said, You fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice, and you won. An exceptional group of young men, forever a symbol of courage that goes far beyond the spilling of their blood, whose depth and sacrifice, combined with absolute modesty, are now embodied in this Congressional Gold Medal. Dave, David Ono is an Emmy Award-winning uh, news correspondent and anchor of ABC down in the Los Angeles area. He does an awful lot of work for the National Veterans Network. Um, and his latest uh, film that we did and presented uh, first at the Evening of Aloha uh, in LA, and then again in the August timeframe of last year when we opened up a new Nisei soldier display at the National Museum of the US Army, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so here's the new trick, right? On the right-hand side is, is just what was going on in the world. What, what's the context of this thing called the 100th 442 and the MIS? And we're starting with the MIS because everything I've gone to, they always go last and we always short them on time and because Roy Matsumoto's daughter's here, so, you know, <laughs> in your honor. Um, but, you know, when, when we go through here, it, it, it actually precedes the formation of the MIS and hostilities with Japan. You know, it was actually legalized discrimination. We've all heard about this Chinese Exclusion Act. If you're, you know, you're an American citizen, you couldn't buy land. And then they said, well, we'll lease land. Well, we'll pass a law so you can't do that either. And uh, so, you know, being in that atmosphere, you kind of have to have that appreciation for what this group of men and women by the way, who volunteered to serve this country, to serve their country, even though that atmosphere existed. And, and I think that's pretty key for us to remember that we have to acknowledge also there's other form that's guaranteed by our constitution, allows you to protest. You don't have to do anything. You can say no to loyalty questions and bear the burden of that because some folks felt that it was a double-edged sword. You, you all know about that. Um, but this group, the 44 Nisei women who joined the WAC, the Women's Army, right, or the Nursing Corps, and the 18 plus thousand Hawaiians and the mainlanders who joined the service, this is what they wanted to do in support of their country because frankly, they were getting their butts kicked, but good. And it was a two front war, something that never had really been done on that scale. So that's what the, the little red boxes on the side are all about. So if that's helpful, I'm gonna ask you about those a little bit later. Uh, I think my dates are right. But hostilities with Japan looked imminent. And the army said, we need some people that can speak the language, but we need to train them on military speak. You know, how do you say tank in Japanese? Everybody can't have a different word for tank or a bazooka or a long range gun or something that sends a projectile 35 you know, miles away. You need to have the military operational art as part of your language skills. And so they started this school before Pearl Harbor. Yeah, did, did, is that a new one for you? Yeah. yeah, so and it was at the Presidio. But hey, Pearl Harbor happened, Executive Order 9066. And with that, Right, the, the military exclusion zones came into existence and guess where the very first military intelligence service language school was located? In the exclusion zone. Pretty, pretty dumb, right? So, in fact, here's a story for you. Um, and this is from the Center of Military History. General DeWitt was at the Presidio and saw these group of uh, Japanese looking soldiers in American uniforms and said to his aide, what the F is this? And it was a secret program. Remember, in, in the intelligence world and classifications, you have to have a need to know. Just because you have a high level security clearance doesn't mean you have access, you know? So you have to have a need to know. He didn't have a need to know and he didn't know what the heck was going on. 
Um, his aide found out what was what the MIS, L, you know, LS was all about. He told him, "Well, it's the first class. They're going to graduate." And he said, "Get them the hell out of here." And that's why the new school ended up in Minnesota because this thing called exclusion zones. So they graduated in May, and the ink wasn't you know dry on their diplomas, and and they were they were the hell out of there, you know. So that's kind of an interesting story to me. How did we get to Camp Savage and later to Fort Snelling? Well, Snelling came because they just outgrew the facilities. But why to Minnesota, for God's sakes? Um, most of those students uh, went uh, to the Pacific on the island hopping campaign. And, uh, and this is where we begin to see some of these military intelligence service uh, infantrymen who were linguists uh, start to earn their combat infantryman's badge. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. That badge, if you're in the army, is a big deal. You can only get it if you're in the infantry and if you're in a combat zone. So a lot of folks walk around, right, in the big army. You'll, you'll see a picture of it here. Next slide. So um, off they went, 27th Infantry Division. Um, in this particular book, it was first published, uh, Masao, The Secret War, and then it was republished called Rising Sun. Uh, it's written by a local artist, and Masao Abe uh, is from the Kent area. That's where he went and retired after uh, serving in the military. Um, and if you want to look at this, you know, I'll, I'll leave it up here. Please go right ahead and, and look through it. But it's, it's a, an account between Sandra Bea, who's a school teacher in Marysville Public School District, and uh, Masao, and she just put a micro cassette recorder and just started to talk to him. And I listened to a lot of those tapes, and so it was about sushi, dim sum, what's gonna be cooking, and then interspersed there, something would just click, and he would start to talk about the war. Um, that's Kathy's father-in-law, Kathy Matsudara, okay, Abe's uh, father-in-law. And I tried to get him to talk, and he talked a little bit uh, to me, but you know, I wasn't back here then, so we really needed another way. And so Sandy just sat with him over the course of a couple of years, every couple of days, I mean, every uh, couple of days, uh, every week. And she just has tons of, of this, you know, Masao just saying, hey, I, gee, spam, that reminds me of a story. A guy got sniped over here. So it was, it was hilarious. It was sobering, uh, emotional, um, but very revealing. And it led to this book called Rising Sun. I, I encourage you to check it out. I don't know if it's uh, available on audiobook, because um, I listen to audiobooks and I put it on one and a half speed. So they sound like Alvin and the Chipmunks, but you get through it faster. Right? <laughs> but they also started to, you know, um, assist and be linguist translators, and they actually went out and scouted in enemy territory by themselves, like what you'll hear of Maryland's Marauders. There's a story, and I'm sure many of you have heard, uh, Karen's dad, Roy Matsumoto, crawled, found out that his unit, Maryland's Marauders, were gonna get attacked uh, by a very large force, brought that information back, they left their foxholes, built their fires up a little bit higher, kind of making that one up. Um, and then they ambushed the enemy. And when the enemy found out what was happening, in other words, they weren't, you know, the U.S. guys weren't where they were supposed to be, Roy jumped up and in a certain dialect began to tell the men to attack, not to falter, keep going forward. And this is where the, the Kibe, the ones who were born in the U.S. but educated in Japan, brought a certain skill set um, it's like talking to somebody from the South, right? There, how many people say pop or Coke or soda? I mean, the first time I got stationed in the South, the waitress asked me, you want a Coke? I said, sure. And she's looking at me like, you're gonna tell me what kind you want? I said, a Coke. She goes, okay, you must be a Yankee. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to tell her I actually wanted a Coca-Cola. Up around here, we say what, pop or soda? It's kind of like that. So he had that special dialect. Am I saying this right? Okay, see? Um, and he was able to tell this group to keep going on and, and they wiped them out. Saved Merrill's Marauders to, to fight another day. 
And on this whole island hopping campaign, um, they were more than just you know, people who read documents, captured documents, or intercepted radio communications. They were actually out there in the fight. And the book Rising Sun, you'll actually hear, and I think Roy had the same thing. He had a couple of other GIs with you so that if you're gonna get overrun, they had to kind of make sure you didn't get captured. But they also had to make sure that you weren't being harassed by other GIs. Because here you were, you look like the enemy, and you're wearing a, a US Army uniform. Friend of foe, I don't care if you have the right password, you know, shoot first, ask later. So, you know, they let, they led a dangerous life. So when we hear things like a two front war, well, for them, I guarantee it was more than that. <laughs> you know, it was, it was survival. It was survival and you had to be sad. You had to have your wits about you. Going to the bathroom took on a whole new meaning. You had to wake up your buddy and say, hey, you, you need to go with me here. All right. So they had to be aware of, of their situation. Um, one of the things I just learned about last year was the Battle of the Philippine Sea. Um, they received some intelligence, and it was an MISer who understood the significance of that. Now, he didn't have Navy speak, if you will. So he translated the documents, discovered what the importance was, and that, I can't remember the individual's name right now, but that MISer is attributed with turning the tide of the battle uh, of the Imperial Navy. They wipe them out. They turn the whole tide, the Battle of the Philippine Sea. And so that linguist was able to translate that, hand it off to another naval officer who had some Japanese skills and, and really get what they call intelligence prep of the battlefield, all right? They really found out what the Japanese were going to do. And in an overwhelming force, they were able to turn the tide of the Battle of the Philippine Sea, broke the back of the Imperial Navy. And then of course, you know, the Battle of Okinawa was just horrific. Uh, you had people, civilians too, who, who would just fight to the last person. Um, how many have seen the ceremony of the Congressional Gold Medal where you saw the three individuals receiving the actual gold medal from then the Speaker of the House? Um, the last individual, right, uh, Grant Ichikawa, is attributed with single-handedly, uh, by himself, <laughs> um, coaxing a group of 100 armed Imperial soldiers out to say, listen, your country needs you. You're, you're losing the war. You don't do any good, you know, killing yourselves. And, and they were gonna kill him. Um, the general officer that he was talking to ended up doing that. He ended up killing him uh, himself, right? But he let his men decide for themselves. Um, now I never talked to Grant on uh, if he ever kept in touch with any of them. Um, but I kind of would like to have known to, did my little speech make a difference? Did, were you glad that you, you kind of you know, didn't do what you were ordered to do and returned home and helped rebuild your country, which is tremendous for us, especially with uh, things are in, in, in the Indo-Pacific right, region, right, where you have um, the security alliance with Japan, the U.S. security alliance with Japan is very strong. They're, they're a key ally, and it's a, it's a great big launching point of hostilities that were occur in the peninsula or in other areas of the Pacific. Next slide. So the MIS, very secret. Um, they didn't receive their presidential unit citation, which was called the, unit, the Distinguished Great uh, Unit Citation earlier. Uh, but in the 60s, that name was changed to, to the Presidential Unit Citation until much later. Uh, very well deserved. Um, you've heard me talk about you know, the intelligence that they gained to really gain a hand in the Philippine Sea. When Admiral Yamamoto's plane was shot down, they captured this thing called um, Plan Z. Z. Plan Z contained the entire battle plan for the Pacific. That was captured by Philippine guerrillas who then transported over to US forces and it was all translated by MISers. And so the US really had uh, an, a key element, which was, we know what you're probably going to do we probably know where you're gonna launch your operation, and we probably know which armaments and where you're gonna get it from. Um, there was an individual who was working in the Pentagon who discovered a document that had been, was gonna be shredded up, and it was the complete industrial complex in Japan and where they were located and exactly what widget they produced. And so they turned that over to the Army Air Forces, and that's when they did the high altitude strategic daylight bombing and 
pretty much you know wiped out those industries. And so you can only imagine you know, what Russia is happening right now, right? The supply chain is being interrupted. Uh, if you don't have things to fight with, your ability to fight really goes down, you know, and that, that weighs on, on the troops as well. So the, the linguists really had a hand in turning the tide of the battle. But Karen's dad was a recipient of, of the Legion of Merit. Um, and he's also a, an inductee into the Ranger Hall of Fame. There was an initial class of inductees, but he was the first class after that original cadre. And then, and he's local, right? The other one is Grant Hirabayashi, born, raised in Kent, uh, went out to Washington, D.C., but he too was with Roy, uh, at, with Merrill's Marauders. He too is inducted into the Ranger Hall of Fame. Uh, not attributed to the World War II MISers, but um, Judge Vince Okamoto from California is also in the Ranger Hall of Fame. Uh, he is attributed with being the most highly decorated Vietnam War veteran of uh, American of Japanese ancestry. Uh, so it's a big deal to get inducted into that. Um, that little graphic there, that's a combat inf infantryman's badge. Every infantry person, it's kind of a badge of, of, of honor, badge of courage. And it, and it really is, because again, you can only get that if you're an infantryman, 11 Bravo, and you've served in a combat zone. All right. And so for um, Masao Abe, when he joined Nisei Veterans Committee, and here he is wearing an MIS or cap, and nobody knows who the heck they really are, and he walks in with a combat infantryman badge and can't really talk about it. Um, to the 4 4 and 100th guys, they're kind of like, who is this guy? You know, what, what the heck, you know? You weren't you were, you were a 100th and 442 cap. Who the heck are you? And he couldn't tell them. And so 127 of them, right, 121 of them, walking around with a CIV, my goodness, you can only imagine the restraint they had to have because their, their missions were classified. You know? Yeah. Good stuff so far? Yeah. yeah, okay. Are you hearing some new things? Yeah. Oh, good, good. i buy you drinks later. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay, so let's transition to, to the 100th and the 442. You know, there were, there were quite a number, I think 5,200 Niseis already in the armed forces before Pearl Harbor in, in non-segregated units throughout the U.S. Army infantry, logistics, mechanics, everything, every kind of military occupational specialty they were in. Um, and when Pearl Harbor happened, just again on the right-hand side, just to give some context, what else was happening around, um, man, you know, the Army was starting up the MIS, right, in the Presidio, and then Japan just went ahead and attacked Southeast Asia and Pearl Harbor. Um, Territorial Guard was mobilized. About two thirds of them were, were Japanese Americans or other AAPIs, uh, but they weren't going to have that. Martial law was declared. Um, I've got one story from uh, a 100th guy who said that their company commander said, "As long as you wear the uniform of the United States, you're going to be treated as such." And I've heard that for a couple other times. Uh, Couple other people who were in the MIS as well. Um, there, there were the units that they came from. Their uh, superior officers gathered the Nisei together and said, "As long as you're wearing the uniform of, of our country, you will be treated like an American citizen." Um, so, but they were kicked out, right? They were formed up into a field and stripped of their gear and said, yeah, "See you later." And they formed up, you know, other groups. I think you heard the victory group, right? It was basically manual labor. Um, but the war was going badly. Just look on the right-hand side, just in the Pacific. And meanwhile, the, the European theater tour was happening as well. So you can only imagine if you're General Marshall and you're looking for men to fight, right? And here you have this group of American citizens uh, just sitting behind barbed wire fences or being told you can't join the Territorial Guard or you can't be in the, in the National Guard or anything like that. Uh, it prompted the United States, I mean, think about this, as sexist as this is, traditionally men's job went to women because the war is going that badly. Rosie the Riveter, 
flying combat aircraft from the mainland to theater over in Europe, right? I mean, they got the Congressional Gold Medal, right? Women's Air Pilots. My goodness, rightly so. But the war was going that badly. So Terry Shima, who was the former executive director emeritus of the Japanese American Veterans Association, he's done a lot of films saying wise men in Washington decided to do this. Look, I got a little different view. It's a little jaded. They had to. The war was just going that badly, you know. And you can't draft them because they were a classified enemy alien unfit for, for duty, right? Uh, and what optic would that be if you started to draft them? People that were incarcerated, right? That would be so well. So they went out and tried to recruit, and, and they did. But they started with the 100. The 100 formed up, went over to Camp McCoy, and started to train. Next slide, please. And as they were training, the war was going that badly, they started to think about forming up the 442, all right? But because the 100th had already been in training as a group, they went over and saw combat, landed in North Africa, but then did an amphib, amphib assault and did their first combat in Italy, all right? At the back, oh, it should be Monte Cassino. Sorry, I apologize for the misspelling. Right there on the second line. Um, that's where they got the nickname, the Purple Heart Battalion. They got the bejeebers kicked out of them. They just got smacked. And it was a poor campaign. Remember, it's the monastery up at the top of this hill. It was a protected uh, facility, right? Because of its historical significance. Um, it was all foobar to the nth degree. And they basically got decimated, right? And so they were pulled off the line and uh, they, they were getting reconstituted by the four, they would become reconstituted with the 442. And as you can see further down, um, they, they got some more people. We had one individual from Seattle that I know of. I think there are more, but I knew this person. And I, Rick, you know him too, Frank Nishimura. Uh, they called him Junior because he was so young, um, but he was actually with the 100th and had seen many of their major battles. Uh, he's a uh, Troop 53, former scoutmaster. Uh, I owe him a lot because when I was a senior patrol leader at summer camp, I got fired. <laughs> so it taught me a lot about accountability, how to lead and manage. I owe a lot to that man. But he was with the 100, uh, even though he was a mainlander, also known as a Katon, right? Um, and, and later, the 100, they formed up with the 442. They were known as the 100th Infantry Battalion Separate. But later on, they said, look, why don't you all fight together? We left 1st Battalion back at Shelby to train to do the training, right? And they got redesignated as the 171st Training Battalion, something like that. And we'll just go ahead and we'll make you 1st Battalion. And that's when the 100th said, look, you know, our battle record, can, can we keep our designation? So that's why you always see 100 slash 442, really the, the 1st Battalion because there was a second and third battalion as well. They were really the first battalion, but because they, they had seen combat as an organization from Hawaii, they asked if they could keep their designation and it was granted by the U.S. Army. Um, so again, they joined up the 442, fought, and, and kind of remember these dates because you're gonna see something on one of these slides, which is about the awards and decorations, which is a little bit goofy, and, and I'll explain that to you here in a sec. Next slide, please. <laughs> Um, so when we go to the 442 though, so let's talk about them. Look on the right hand side and you'll see well before the men, you know, the Nisei women were allowed to join the Women's Army Corps. It was the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. Then Delano Roosevelt signed an executive order, changed the name right to the Women's Army Corps. Uh, and they were also allowed to join the, nursing, the Army's Nursing Corps before the 442 was ever formed up. Right? Yay for the Nisei women. <laughs> <laughs> that must have pissed off my uncles, right? <laughs> um, so they formed up, they assembled at Camp Shelby, a good chunk of them, they say two thirds, came from Hawaii um, over time. Um, and then again, they trained at Shelby for almost a year, then got sent over to Italy, formed up at the 100th, uh, and then they went into the first battle together. And if you notice the time timelines, Learning how to, how to fight, 
is way different than the way they're trained. And so a lot of learning occurred between June and October. And, and, and learn they did. Uh, some folks would say that General Mark Clark, General Dahlquist used th this group of soldiers as, as cannon fodder, meaning they're expendable. If you go back and look at the rescue of the Lost Battalion, three other groups had tried to do this already. Couldn't push past it. A lot of folks would say, well, these other three groups dwindled the forces down so it was easier for, for, for the 442-100. It still took them over a week to do it. And if you've ever seen David Ono's film recently where he took a drone and started at the bottom of that hill and flew that thing up, it is mind-boggling. It, it's like night and day looking at a topography map and then seeing it from a drone. It's the first time I've ever seen that angle. It's magnificent. And it's available on YouTube, by the way. Uh, I wish I had the URL for you. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about how hard this fight was, there's another book that was printed by a um, best-selling author who wrote Boys in the Boat. It's being made into a movie, by the way, um, by Daniel James Brown. It's called Facing the Mountain. Um, Fred Shiyosaki, who was in K Company, and a normal-sized company, full complement, during World War II is about 250 to 300 men, right? I think they walked out with 15. They went into the battle, I think, with 35 or 40. I think that's right. Uh, bottom line is they did not walk in with 200 full-strength you know, company. Um, but it's not to discount that a very small number of them walked out. Uh, Fred is one of the four individuals that are talked about in this book. E each chapter, if you're there are four main ones, Gordon Hirabayashi and then three other, uh, 442. Fred Shiyosaki's uh, born and raised in, in Spokane. Um, I got to meet him when he was here at the Nisei Veterans Committee for a few, for a couple of years uh, before he went back to Spokane. Uh, he passed away last year. Um, it was a very nice service in his gravesite. Just looks out over this valley. It's very pretty. But uh, he has done some oral histories. And, and if you ever get a chance to just see what he thinks about about that rescue, it's, it's pretty telling, at least from his lens, how he handled one of the guys who was rescued on the train and his regret for not treating him better. But but needless to say, he was pretty pissed off at him, you know. Um, but that gained some pretty big notoriety for the 10442. But Fred, it took many years for him to get past that and to accept that. Anyway, next slide. So remember, I talked about dates: eleven months of fighting. Now, if you look at the 100, they were in the fight well before. And but if you look at the time when they were formally put together, that is about 18 months, 17 to 18 months of fighting. So when the U.S. Army Center of Military History says that the 442-100 is the most highly decorated unit for its size, it's a regimental combat team, and length of service, 18 months, where you have seven presidential unit citations, 21 medals of honor, even though one was only awarded during World War II, doesn't discount the valor that those men had during that time. And so, and the other ones are Distinguished Service Cross, Silver Star, Silver Star with Oak Leaf Cluster, Legion of Merit. I don't know what that's, Service Medal, Bronze Star Medal, and then Purple Hearts. And the reason for the, the wide range there is, um, even the Center of Military History, when I talked to uh, Dr. Jim McNaughton, you, you know him, right? Uh, they can't get their records because you know, you've got people like K. Yamamoto, and you see it like three times with no service number next to that. Was well, that, did the person get it three times or that three different people? You know, so that's why you have these wide ranging numbers here. So I took, I, I usually say the more conservative number, I say 4,000 plus. But that's a lot. That's a lot, right? For that length of time, for the amount of combat they did, holy moly. Now, for the presidential unit citations, you'll notice that. The 100th by themselves, they have two of those. One was when they were a, a separate unit. 
The other one was when they were attached to the 442. Okay, and then the other ones were, you know, reg, you know, the entire regiment received one, and the second and third battalions received their individual ones, you know, so on and so forth. Interesting thing about Company L, um, and you'll see later on in the document, uh, it was signed by a, a Lieutenant General um, a Trucott, and pretty humble guy from what I understand, uh, based on everything that I've read about him, um, but. Boy, he was an SOB, and his, his mantra to folks was, you cannot be a good commander if you're not an SOB, but you didn't have to be mean about it, you didn't have to be vindictive about it, but you just gotta make those hard calls, right? You gotta be pretty, Japanese, you say chunkdo, right? Pretty on the line there. Um, but he's the one that actually pinned the presidential unit citation on Company L's guide on, and there's a nice picture of him doing that, so. That's pretty nice to know. Um, he was the 5th Army commander. He took over from General Clark when General Clark got promoted and took over 5th Army Group. Um, so he was, he was the new 5th Army commander. Next slide. So here's something I don't think anybody's ever seen. A group of us, and I just did all the uh, battle maps uh, over at the National Archives in, in College Park, and I didn't do all that many, maybe 30 or 40. But there was a group led by a guy named Dave Buto, whose dad was in the Burma, the MIS, the Burma campaign. And I actually have a picture of Dave's dad, who's in this jungle attire, a grass skirt, and <laughs> looks like a native. <laughs> it's just so funny. But he put together this group, and we went out to the National Archives in College Park and just took pictures of everything. Because before that, a lady named Yamamoto, she went over and she actually photocopied all the files but they're not indexable. You can't search it. So if you're looking for something, you gotta go through 30,000 pages of stuff. So we went back in there and we scanned everything, digitalized everything. It resides over at the University of Hawaii right now. But you can access many of those documents by looking at the dcjava.org email uh, URL, and you can search for some of these things. So I pulled a couple of these things up. Um, where, again, you could say racial prejudice, or there was just that much valor on the battlefield. There probably was. Um, but what led to the denial of all these, you know, Medal of Honor recommendations during World War II of these Japanese Americans, these Nisei from the 100th and the 442? So I thought I'd, I'd look at a couple. And James Okubo is kind of interesting because local, right? But he also has a dental clinic named for him, after him at uh, Madigan, Fort Lewis. Did, did you know that? Yeah, Medal of Honor recipient. Um, but it was downgraded. So I really think the appropriate level award is the Silver Star. And then, you know, Barney Hajiro, who had already been awarded the second highest award for valor, uh, they downgraded his. Um, both were denied by the War Department. So let's go to the next slide. So this is the citation that was actually used uh, from the Congressional Medal of Honor Society webpage. And I just highlighted a few things. So let me just be quiet. Take a minute to kind of look at that. This is a medic, by the way, which means he doesn't carry a weapon. And he's got a big red cross on his helmet, which for me is a target. Right? <laughs> Think about that. Yeah. So on three separate dates, this citation says, this is what this individual did to save wounded com comrades out in the open without a weapon. You know, he had to conceal himself. And the last part here, exposed to hostile fire directed at him. That means he wasn't just running through a hail of bullets. The, he was running through a hail of bullets that were actually directed at him. They were trying to get him. So big significance. So these words kind of matter in these citations, right? So let's take a look at the next slide. So this is the actual document that we scanned that says, yeah, yeah, we've read this and yeah, no. We think, we think the appropriate medal is a Silver Star. Still good, my uncle, recipient of the Silver Star, right? Third highest award for valor, yeah, pretty good medal. But when you look at the citation, you know, that's why his medal was upgraded. 
Let's look at the next one. So this is Barney Hajiro. <laughs> and I'm, I've met Barney. And every time I saw Barney, this was his face. <laughs> he, he was just a tough guy, like all of the men of the 1442. But he, he, he was just tough. Hawaii boy, right? Just tough. I never saw a picture of him smiling at all. He's always, you know. Uh, but this is his citation, again, from the Congressional Medal of Honor Society webpage. His assaults were always uphill, and he carried a Browning automatic rifle. It's about 30 pounds, and the magazine is like a little, a little weight, if you will. So, and you had two people on a, on a BAR team, the person holding the, the, the rifle, to, and, and the other one's carrying the ammo and another barrel. That's how hot this thing would get. So he's running around, out in the open, telling his men what to do, laying fire down, exposing himself, and he's going uphill, he's carrying all his gear, he's carrying a 30 pound rifle, laying down deadly fire, and he was able to suppress them uh, on a couple of, on three different dates. So BAR people typically, like M60s or what they call saw, saw now, right? They typically don't last very long. So this guy was a really good soldier or really short, no, he was about this high. Yeah. But holy moly, this, can, can you imagine? Next slide. So this, this is the, uh, you'll see two orders. And again, this is the actual copy of the field order, right? Um, so this is, at this time, I, and I don't have my dates quite right. I don't know if this is General Truscott or if it was General Clark because it's directed to the 5th Army CG. Um, but they said, we've looked at this, uh, you know, if, if the War Department concurs, we'll revoke the other one. Um, but we think this is, you know, what he ought to get. Um, so next slide. And again, uh, European Theater, of, so the top line, European Theater of Operations, United States Army, to the Commanding General 6th Army Group, um, about uh, the Giro, uh, and again, it, it, if we, we think it's, it's, it's appropriate that it gets the DSC, but if the War Department overrules us, then we'll revoke uh, the, the order for the DSC. Uh, and oh, by the way, he already had a DSC, Defense or the uh, Distinguished Service Cross, the second highest award for valor. Um, interesting. It, first time seeing this for folks? This kind of, yeah. The, the, the database we put together is full of stuff. Um, my relatives here, we, we have seen things from my uncle, our scoutmaster, uh, other family members, and it includes not just the 100th 442, but it also includes the uh, military intelligence service. And though there was another box in, in the area that had yet to be declassified, um, had a nice classification security clearance at the time. So I was able to kind of go over and kind of look through some things. It's a gold mine. It's an absolute gold mine, but you know they're 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 driven by costs and staffing. So you have to make time to go into those boxes, and you have to tell them that the file is here, the box is here, but you have to have classification, a class uh, a security clearance to know that. So it's hard to get those things to classify, and you just can't tell them, hey, can you go in there and declassify as many military intelligence service files and boxes as you can? The NARA just doesn't work that way, and. Um, if I'm not mistaken, even under a FOIA request, you can't do that. You have to kind of specify the document you're looking for. Next slide. So for us, it's great that the Bainbridge Island Museum you know, of Art puts on sessions like this. That this story is so American. It is so American that what can we do to get the word out? And so again, um, the Nisei Veterans Committee is part of the National Veterans Network. And we've worked very closely with other big organizations like the Smithsonian Institution. One thing we did not want to have happen is have that Congressional Gold Medal, which by law, the Smithsonian is the caretaker for, to go back into the archives. Remember that last scene out of the, out of the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark? They're, they're wheeling that big cart back to the sea of a, of a warehouse. We did not want that thing to go back there because it would never see the light of day. 
So to buy ourselves some time to produce some educational content and to you know, find appropriate sponsors, fundraising to build a secure case because it's solid gold and the U.S. Marshals require a certain security footprint for that. We sent it on a seven city tour. <laughs> let, let others kind of you know, buy, buy us some time. To, and this is what happened. We worked with Night Kitchen, created the website. Uh, they even upgraded it, their web servers to accommodate the, the uptick in, in research. Um, that's where the video is hosted on the Smithsonian Institution site, the National Museum of American History. But having all of those resources for teachers, if any of you have educators in your, in your circle of friends, your circles, circles of influence, please tell them. Because the vetting process to get this kind of information up at the Smithsonian it is worse than filling out a security classification form. My God, what we had to go through to get this up there um, was it was phenomenal, but necessary, right? Because the last thing you want to do is put an untruth, right? Then it just ruins the whole credibility. So Smithsonian's done an excellent job. We continue to uh, update that website. Um, we've had teachers from the Montgomery School District in Maryland, the Fairfax County School District in Virginia and Washington, D.C. constantly review our content. Uh, we went into this with a certain approach. They said, yeah, no. <laughs> That's not going to work for our kids. And they completely rewrote that. Uh, and we just went back in there and revisited that workshop. Uh, we have some nice books that are available. So again, if you have educators out there, or if you're just curious, please let me know. Um, talk to Ken. You know, we'll get your email address and I'll send you a copy. Okay. Elementary and for high school. Um, next page. But to us, the capstone event was getting that display, the, the Nisei soldier experience during World War II, and it wasn't just about the 100th, the 442, and the MIS. It also included individuals in non-segregated units. Ben Kuroki, has anybody heard of him before? The boy from Nebraska. Community leaders, state senators, representatives pushed the Army hard because this person from North Platte, um, Nebraska, wanted to be a gunner in the Army Air Corps, and they wouldn't let him. Born and raised there. And so he flew combat missions, a full combat mission as a tail gunner, I think on a B-25, in Europe, and then transitioned to the Pacific Theater of Operation and flew combat in the Pacific. Now we thought he was the only one, we found out there were three, a total of three that actually flew combat as a, as a gunner on a combat aircraft over Europe and also in, in, in the Pacific. Um, I knew his daughter, Joyce, and uh, I got to meet uh, Ben Kroki a few times. Um, and I'll share one anecdote with you. And I says, hey, you, I saw pictures of you doing this whole recruiting thing. He said, man, a couple of those camps, I, I was lucky to get out of there alive. Because <laughs> yeah, there were some pissed off folks uh, there. And, and exercising their form of their constitutional rights. But it was interesting to hear that from him. But this is up there in its own special exhibit area. It's a new National Museum of the U.S. Army. It will be there for three more years. And we were able to get the Congressional Gold Medal from the National Museum of American History to the Musa because they were supposed to undergo uh, a complete renovation. Now, COVID interrupted all that, so we have to find someplace else to put the CGM because, again, we don't want that to go into the archives. So we're working with the uh, Constitution Hall in Philadelphia to see if the, they'll house that for two or three years. Do I have one more? Okay, so the big event in August. Uh, Dale Watanabe, the executive director from the Japan American Societies for the State of Washington and also a member and a representative of MBC to the NBN uh, participated on this. But um, as you can see, there are tons of artifacts. Uh, the lady on the top right hand corner is Leslie Sakato. Her dad, George Sakato, was a Medal of Honor recipient. Um, the individual in the middle, that's his father's prosthetic hand there, right there in the middle there. So all of these things are, are there. Um, I think right now they're, they will soon open it up so that they'll have walk-ins. Right now you have to have a ticket to get in there. It, it's, it's free, by the way. 
Um, it's on Fort Balboa. It's a little bit west of Mount Vernon and about 16 miles uh, southwest of Washington, D.C. Pro proper. Um, the lady there, I, I actually took that shot. She's looking up at her father. But what caught me was the word, it's an army value, the word loyalty behind her, which I thought was a pretty symbolic photo. But she's looking up at her father and on these stainless steel columns, they call them soldier pylons. You'll have an image of the, of the soldier and a little short narrative of what that individual is about and what they did in the army. It's a magnificent arm, uh, museum. Um, it really does tell the story of, of, of America, you know, from the everyday dog soldier. This isn't about the Colin Powells or the Eric Shinsekis or Tony Tagubas. It's about the everyday soldier. Um, in fact, I saw a couple of people that I know that that were in in displays, you know. So and they didn't know they were in there. Bill Seeger and um, um, Wesley Shimoto, Wayne Shimoto, excuse me. Um, he was the intelligence officer for um, the rescue of the, uh, Iranian hostages. It's one of the first in the inaugural Delta Force, if you will. Uh, Wayne Shimoto. I think that's it. Next slide. Okay, so this is all we went over. So how many people heard things for the first time? Oh, look at that. Okay. In, in, any story that kind of leapt out at you? Anybody? Sir? Yeah, the one that really leapt out at me is the revocation of those medals. At that time, it was the Secretary of War, which would be like the Secretary of Defense. He said those things normally went up to the Department of War. Who was, I mean, obviously the Secretary of War signed off on them, but there were a bunch of people making those, re those recommendations for, re were they civilians? Were there military people involved? Do you have any idea? I don't. I don't. But here... In, in the current army, let's just take army, right? Um, it's an arduous process. And I talked to General Shinseki about the review, all right? Um, so a law had to be passed that you could do that because there's a certain period of time, right, after the act that you have to get witness statements, to have an investigation, to have reports written, to have an investigator make a recommendation uh, to the chief of staff of the army, who's the number one general officer in the army, and then it goes to the Secretary of Defense, and then it's forwarded uh, to the President. Uh, that's current. Who was all involved during World War II days? I do know, if you look at that, that it went from Eisenhower to the European Theater of Operations, U.S. Army Commander Group, the Commanding General, then it went down to the 5th Army Group, to the 5th Army you know, Commanding General. And those are all military people. Yeah. But inside of the Beltway, Washington, D.C., yeah. More, more likely, General Marshall probably had an opinion. It was then, right, uh, the numero uno, like, be like the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, right? Uh, today, equivalent. General Marshall probably had an opinion. I know General Eisenhower didn't want anything really to do with the 100th of the 442, you know, but war was going badly, so they used them. But he, he was not too thrilled about having them there. And that's on the record, by the way. So if you notice, that actually came, one of those orders actually came a denial and review was actually reviewed by General Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. Did he change his mind? You know, I don't know. Um, I haven't, and I haven't looked though, uh, if, if his view of the 100th of World War II or about Americans of Japanese ancestry changed. Um, yeah, so I haven't read anything about that. Um, but I'll tell you, this is why this story matters. There's an there was a, a public law that I think it was just signed by the governor of Oregon to, to rename Route 35, I believe, the Oregon Nisei World War II Memorial Highway. And, and I was happy to provide some written testimony for that. And another individual wrote, in support of renaming that highway and said, you know, unfortunately, my grandfather, I think his name was Buddy, um, was one of those who protested removing the names from an honor wall of Americans of Japanese ancestry. 
but after the war had a change of heart and one was one of the most ardent supporters became the state American Legion commander and did everything that he could in his lifetime uh, to ensure that Nisei soldiers were given the proper respect and a proper recognition. And boy, if that doesn't tell you that, that people can change, but this story matters. And here's another reason why this story matters. You know, as a commissioned officer, we swear to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States, warts and all. And that means you get a right, even though the war is going badly, you have a right to say, I don't want to go. That's between you and your maker, as far as I'm concerned. You have a constitutional right to do that. You have a constitutional right to say, this is not a, a war that, I, you know, that we should be in. Or I'm going to say no. Or, or hell no, I'm not going to go. All those things. You have a constitutional right to do it. Now, I might not like it. And I'll tell you. But I will defend your right to do so. And I think for this group, this sliver of the greatest generation said, you know, the war is going badly. And, and this is my country, warts and all. And they need people who can fight, or nurses or others to ferry, you know, you know a combat aircraft. And so this is what I'm going to do, you know. Um, this individual, and this is why this story again matters so much because does it impact and have, have relevancy today? I think it does. Um, I know when we were stamping the halls of Congress to get the Congressional Gold Medal through, one of the staffers, and actually the, the senator interrupted and said, I gotta tell you, if it wasn't for the battle of the 104th platoon, the MIS, we would not be sitting here. We would not get time with us. So I'm just letting you know, you see, their battle record, not just volunteering to fight during a time when you were incarcerated, but their battle record brought attention to this. And that's why you're gonna get this kind of support. The other part of that is telling this story and having it in context, meaning pre-war prejudice, the hysteria, the fear, the absence of political leadership as concluded by the Wartime Commission on the internment and the relocation of civilians. When you think about what George Bush did on the heels of 9-11, he recalled his president. And I was the guy overseas that had to get the Treasury Secretary back. So you talk about stealing a C-17. <laughs> he told his cabinet, I need you to build some new security protocols to protect our homeland. But oh, by the way, don't, bring, don't be bringing me things that, that will put our Muslim and our Arab Americans like we did to Norm's family in 1942. And the Norm he was talking about was Norm Mineta, who was incarcerated at, is it Heart Mountain? I can't remember which one was it. Heart Mountain. Uh, <coughs> so learning occurred. And I think what George Bush said, and what he told his cabinet, with respect to the constraints they needed to have, because if we didn't want <coughs> to repeat history, make stories like this relevant. Right. We've got to continue to look at that, to use it as a way to guide, you know, next steps, at least for me. So thank goodness George Bush had a dinner with Normetta, asked him, hey, tell me about this thing called incarceration. What was that all about? And he learned from that. And who knew that a few weeks later, 9-11 would happen. Right. For those of us who are overseas, that was scary because we didn't know what the heck was happening. Nobody knew. And the only intelligence we got, frankly, was CNN. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, getting woken up and getting pulled into the uh, into the command center. And I was the chief of protocol at the time, so what the heck am I doing here, right? And watching all this. Uh, but my role then was, look, you got a treasury secretary delegation out here, and you got to get him back home because the president recalled his cabinet. I got to tell you that that was that was tough, but it sure made it nice on reflection to hear that George Bush did what he did. And you can say what you want about everything else, but I give him credit for that. I have a question because... Oh, oh, hold on, hold on. Let, let me... Can you get to the microphone? Okay, sure. Am I doing okay? Can you hear... Oh, great. So during the Second War, 
were Americans aware of the fact that Nisei soldiers were out there fighting for this country? I mean, was there anything during that time? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So that film loop that was played prior to you know starting, that was actually part of part of, of, of other film loops that were used during movie, uh, what do they call it, movie time, something time? Newsreels. Right? Newsreels. Yeah. Newsreels, thank you. And, and yes, but that didn't happen until a little bit later. Now the rescue of the Lost Battalion, now that got big news. Liberating Dachau, didn't. Didn't happen at all. And one of my mentors, Joe Ichiuji, was part of that. Uh, he, he's got some pretty strong feelings of, about that that whole episode, why they were you know, found, discovered, reported, you know, guard, and then pulled back. Um, anyway, did, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Yeah, but it was mostly for propaganda. Ken asked me to talk about the Congressional Gold Medal. Does everyone know about the Congressional Gold Medal? It's the highest award Congress can bestow on an individual or, or a group. Um, the first one was George Washington, you know, uh, sports notables. I think Jack Nicholas got one, Arnold Palmer, um, the <laughs> Apollo astronauts. You know. um, but recently, the uh, Filipino veterans. And the nice thing about that law is it was worded so that if you were a member of that group, regardless of whether you were Filipino or not, did not matter. You know, you were part of that group to fight against the Japanese at that time, and you were authorized to have that, um, that Congressional Gold Medal, so, okay, so did, did I explain it? Okay. So when the African-American soldiers returned from World War II to the South, they found um, a lot of people were trying to prevent them from being able to vote, even though they put their life on the line uh, during the war. I was wondering if the Japanese soldiers, when they returned, had any difficulty like that. Well, I, I don't know about voting, but uh, I have relatives that um, relocated to the Midwest. It was, uh, so I'm Roman Catholic. So Father Teposaro sent, who went with his flock over in the Seattle area, the Marino group, went over to, um, with them to Minidoka and sent letters out. I actually have copies of his letters. Sent letters out to the parishes to find out if there were communities that were sympathetic to Americans of Japanese ancestry. And he would let folks know. Did you know Father Flanagan from Boys Town had a, had a group there? Yeah, I didn't know that until after I left Omaha, Nebraska. I wish I had known, because I had visited Boys Town uh, several times. Um, but I would like to have seen some of the homes that they would have stayed in. But he, he hosted several families, Father Flanagan, Boys Town. So that's kind of, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, but voter suppression, I, I couldn't answer that question. But were there suppression about other things, like being able to buy homes like in Seward Park? Those things existed, yeah. But, but they worked through it, right? By being good citizens, you know, being productive citizens. Uh, doing the very best they can with what they had at the moment in time, as arduous, and my auntie Hisa over here can tell you, um, my goodness, you know, on their sto shoulders, you know, we all stand, and I really mean that. We stand on their shoulders because there's no way I could have been the director of nuclear policy for the Secretary of Defense if it wasn't for that generation. They're the ones that laid that out. There's no way we would have seen, you know, an Eric Shinseki. General, 34th Chief of Staff of the Army. No way that would have happened. It would have happened way later, way later. So I'm, we stand on, on their shoulders, and actually all of us do, because I think diversity, because you get not just of gender, but of thought, of perspective. I mean, how's that bad? Then you make a good, more informed decision, right? Well, it's not just about numbers and quotas. It's a perspective that people bring in, in my opinion. You mentioned something about the liberation of Dachau. Uh, my father was in the 42nd Infantry, and I was always told that they were the ones who liberated Dachau, along with, I think, one airborne division. So what is the connection with the 4th yeah. and 2? So the 522, the first group, US soldiers to get there, and they were pulled back 
to allow a different unit to be credited with liberating that camp. What? So they were there first? Yeah. Now, here's the other, so let me just do a little, think about that. How can you, how can you, <laughs> your enemy could use this. So there's, there's actually a little bit of, you know, information operations going on here. Um, how can you show Americans of Japanese ancestry liberating a concentration camp, in other words, people behind barbed wire, and you got a whole bunch of citizens in the mainland, in where? Behind barbed wire. Yeah, don't make that don't make good PR, man. <laughs> you know? Whether whether the rest of the country knew that or not, yeah, that's bad PR. You know? So I'm not condoning it. Because there are other instances where that happened, right? I mean, how many newsreels do you see of the Lost Battalion uh, post when they finally got to them? How many Japanese Americans do you soldiers do you see in those newsreels? Part of that was because they had they were told press on. Okay, so folks say, well, they, you know, here we go again, you know, uh, mainstream, mainstream society gets the credit. Well, actually, they had to press on because they actually were able to push, you know, the Germans off of that hill. And so they proceeded to, you know, to, to, to prosecute the war, if you will. We probably have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, I want to make sure that... that all the Seattle folks are able to get out of here and catch the nine o'clock vote. And oh so no, we're staying at your town. house. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. Well, thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen.